Uh, shouldn't yeah. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jane Kay, and I am very pleased to welcome you all to our fourth and final seminar in this series, which is our Law and Technology Invited to Speakers series at the University of Oxford. And our focus is on AI and healthcare. So we're very lucky to have our speaker, Dr. Anjali Mazunder of the Alan Turing Institute. Unfortunately, she wasn't here able to attend last week, but I'm delighted that everybody else has just taken that in their stride and has turned up to hear her this week. Um, so we're going to have a 20 to 25 minute uh, presentation followed by general discussion. Um, please, uh, please put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. We are recording the session and both the presentation and the discussion and the podcast will be available to stream from the Helix and faculty websites. So Anjali, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, uh, showing up today um, and appreciate your patience and understanding. Uh, so I think Imogen is going to kindly um, share my slides for me uh, and navigate them. Brilliant. So um, as so I am the theme lead on AI and justice and human rights at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, and I'm a statistician by background. So my claim here is I'm not a lawyer, um, but I work very closely with um, colleagues in, in the legal field um, as I've very much been focused at the intersection of statistics and the law. And really I'm motivated by and interested in addressing questions that really consider how to balance the opportunity of AI interventions to improve services and address societal challenges with against the risks and the harms um, that it might also pose. And so often in talking about AI and human rights, the concerns around privacy and surveillance, bias and discrimination, or mission and fun function creep are the ones that usually come to the surface. However, I just want to um, raise that I in fact also look at um, how we can use data science and AI methods to really um, address some of these um, human rights even challenges, including things like um, areas such as modern slavery and human trafficking, um, or areas of uh, right to life, and modern slavery poses a really interesting one for me because it is both about um, prohibition of slavery, but also the, the freedom of movement. And when we think about, think the pandemic, while it initially started in one place, it spread, um, creating a, a global um, pandemic, as we would say. Uh, and in fact, that that is, um, one of the issues that needs to be considered is this movement, not only of people, but data um, and how that flows. So um, next slide, please. So AI, and I use the term AI in the loosest sense here. Um, so these are often statistical methods, data science, machine learning methods um, that have been evoked um, and are being adopted to tackle some of the world's greatest challenges and in the administration of public services. And they involve opportunities and risks. They've proliferated our society and they are changing and improving healthcare services, transportation, financial services, amongst others. And this past year, has accelerated the development and use of data-driven technologies in response to the COVID-19 crisis. So the same benefits that AI provides has also identified potential harms. 
such as ones that I've mentioned of bias and discrimination, privacy and surveillance. So again, whilst AI has this opportunity to make that critical step change, it also poses these risks to infringe on human rights, further exacerbating inequalities. So the successful deployment and use of such tools requires identifying and considering the potential risks and harms with the benefit of AI adoption. And it goes beyond the initial method or tool itself, but considering what are potentially some of the downstream harms as well. So my approach um, in, in work has been to consider responsible and inclusive data collection and AI design um, to aid in the development and deployment, considering both legal, ethical, technical, and sociocultural issues alongside bringing in stakeholder and community engagement, which poses several important and sometimes opposing um, questions or issues at hand. Now, just digging in a little further, of course, AI is reliant on data, and this data may be personal, sensitive, or proprietary. There is also the notion that you must be seen to be measured and to benefit from these interventions. But data is often siloed, and yet the digital traces, much like people, move across borders, leaving a deluge of data from the digital exhaust um, that we leave from our everyday interactions, from mobile phones and online um, communications and financial transactions of credit cards. So this combination, though, of different data sources has the potential to derive high quality information, reduce knowledge gaps, and garner actionable insights. Uh, but again, the digital divide and historical structural inequalities isolates and endangers some of the poorest and marginalized from benefiting from these AI interventions. So when access to data is limited, for example, in healthcare, which we'll get into a little bit more, baseline data sets may not be representative of the populations that the AI systems are hoping to serve. And as you might suspect, that it is often women and girls, rural dwellers, ethnic minority, people with disabilities, migrants, refugees, and the LGBTQ plus community that are systematically excluded um, and deprived of some of these opportunities and, equi and equitable benefits. Uh, we've seen some recent examples of AI interventions that demonstrate these differential impacts. Some of the high profile ones have been around facial recognition, but also access to healthcare services in the, U in the US, which uh, placed um, uh, healthy white patients ahead of sicker black patients. And this also placed the role of diversity and inclusion in at the center of AI design. So again, getting back to my premises, uh, well, optimal AI is an AI that benefits all, but how can we achieve that becomes a great preponderance. So the extent to which AI can have a positive or negative impact on society depends on how we actually shape this technology and the mechanisms and practices to put into place to ensure that they are carefully designed, developed, deployed, and monitored over time. And what we have seen is that policymakers um, and uh, that policymakers, practitioners, and, ac and academics have been debate debating regulation and developing principles for responsible AI innovation over the years. And whilst those conversations and efforts persist, that the development and deployment has continued. And in particular, with the pandemic, governments across the globe have enacted new legislation to allow for new measures and a lax in potential data protection standards that are allowing for new data science and AI technologies to tackle COVID-19. Next. So I get back to this question, which I'd like us to keep in mind is, how do we enable the opportunities of data, data flows and AI to improve services and address society's um, 
greatest challenges. And in this particular case, it's COVID-19, um, whilst balancing against mitigating against risks and harms such as bias and discrimination, infringement on data protection and privacy, and the concerns of surveillance and mission creep. Next, please. So it's without a doubt that AI can be used and is being developed and deployed in a number of ways to tackle COVID-19 and mitigate against its wider impact on society ranging from areas of drug discovery, such as treatments and vaccines, medical decision-making for diagnosis and prognosis, health policy around predicting and tracking the spread of the disease, and public safety measures around social protection. What we've also seen, though, is with a real community engagement um, that there has also been new data sources being created while volunteers come together to support their community. So I'll just talk you through a couple of examples of where data science and AI has been played, but also in doing so, raise some of the risks and concerns around bias and discrimination, privacy and surveillance, um, and mission creep. So digging a little further, AI has been lauded for its potential to contribute to just drug discovery, accelerating both processes of discovering new drugs and repurposing existing drugs and identifying potential vaccine targets. But as the medical and scientific rigor and checks required before drugs will be approved, even after identification, its, it's efficacy often takes up to 18 months and it's uncertain how effective and available um, they will be though we are already seeing the benefits of the vaccine rollout. But one thing to remember is that the evidence available so far has suggested that minority ethnic groups in England, particularly Black and South Asian people, may be at increased risk of testing positive for COVID-19 and having um, more fatal consequences. Now, what is the data that this is based on, um, both in terms of the inequalities but also some of the treatments and vaccines. So biobank data is one of the standard um, um, or substantive uh, health data available. And biobank data contains biological samples from hundreds of thousands of participants, often across the globe that have been created. And they have been helping scientists and um, clinicians collaborate to identify factors for developing specific diseases in some instances, though, this data can be linked to unique health patient ident identification numbers, which allow scientists to investigate the effects of lifestyle and an individual's genetic makeup on the disease cause. However, these biobanks have a poor representation of ethnic minority groups. In some instances, it's less than 10% of the total sample. So the majority of the samples are based on European Caucasians. And a report from the Wellcome Trust, um, which was entitled Public Perceptions of the Collection of Human Biological Samples, suggests that some ethnic minorities, particularly first-generation immigrants, are unlikely to take part in research projects due to suspicions they hold on the motivation of those carrying out the research, even though there was nothing to suggest that the UK Biobank was unethical in its approach. So why is that? Well, these are embedded in historical events. During a meningitis epidemic in Northern Nigeria in 1996, Pfizer treated some children with the, with the experimental drug trovafloxacin, apologies for the pronunciation there, um, for which it was claimed that proper informed consent by the children's guardians was not obtained. It was also alleged that some received a dose lower than recommended. 11 children died and many more suffered from lifelong disabilities. In 1999 through 2000, um, by scientists from John Hopkins Hospital in the US, used Indian guinea pigs to test the drug. Again, I'm going to mispronounce this one. Nordihydrogeoretic, NDGA, let's go with that, which was tested on 26 cancer patients 
The patients were completely unaware that they were involved in a clinical trial, and they were unaware that they were being denied established treatments. Two patients subsequently died. So what we can see here is that understanding these issues and the lack of trust sets out challenges in data representativeness in ethnic minorities. So examining whether and in what ways potential differences between ethnic groups figures in the creation design and rationale of biobanks and other um, healthcare data is significant to knowing, to determining whether or not a, a data-driven intervention will be fair and effective across different groups. So once treatments and vaccines are identified, of course, the concern shifts potentially to allocation, which is something that we have seen. Um, from a global perspective, there is a risk that developing countries will not benefit from such new accelerated drug discovery unless there is an equitable mandate enforced, allowing all countries to access, access to the benefits of, of such drugs. So, Another area has been around detecting, tracking, and predicting disease outbreak and spread. So the ability to detect, predict, and track disease outbreak can help public health officials to take measures to contain and reduce the impact of diseases early. AI-based systems are often and can be used to monitor and, tra and track um, how diseases will spread. These systems often draw together multiple sources of data, including aggregated official data, validated reports, and social media. Before the, the WHO issued a statement regarding a cluster of pneumonia cases, AI-based systems sounded the alarm predicting the outbreak of an infection in late December 2019. This was a health map at Boston Children's Hospital and Blue Dot. Um, the latter, which academics warned of 20 cities that may be at the forefront of the global spread. Colleagues of mine um, at the Delphi Group at Carnegie Mellon University developed um, technological capability of epidemiological forecasting. This was, this was adapting their seasonal flu prediction system to now casting and forecasting COVID-19, drawing together data from symptom surveys, search trends, aggregated health partner data, and official records. The self-reported descriptions of COVID-19 related symptoms correlated well and test confirmed cases of the disease, su suggesting that self-reports might soon help in forecasting COVID-19 activity. And this is what we've seen with the King's College London um, uh, Zoe Health Science Company, um, which have developed the AI diagnostic to predict whether someone is likely to have COVID-19 based on their symptoms collected using the COVID symptom study app. So, but self-reporting data has, long, has been a long-standing methodological approach, inviting its own set of bias and limitations. And in the, area, in the era of Internet of Things, social networking sites provide a rich data source. However, used alone can invite bias, as it's only one part of the population that is reporting and being seen. Combining data sources offers better prediction accuracy. However, the digital divide and socioeconomic disparities within and between countries may precipitate into regional estimates um, and uncertainty. So despite early warning systems, countries and governments were still slow to respond and will only be most useful when governments are prepared to respond to such an, an alert. These efforts to track and predict um, may aid in prioritizing testing efforts where they are most needed and in regions where access to limit to testing is limited. The two other ones that I'd like to just raise, which pose probably the most concerns, are around diagnosis and prognosis, as well as social protection. So as clinicians need to be able to intervene and prevent patients from deteriorating, it is unsurprising that AI has been um, developed and used in this way. So there's been a growing effort to train AI models to diagnose COVID-19 using chest radiography images. And it's been reported that those, hospital, um, that those hospitalized for severe critical COVID-19 often suffer pneumonia and acute respiratory failure. But the computational model of some of these um, are only presented on a limited number of images. So 
what is the, the potential challenge here? Well, while it might be most effective here, there is a challenge here that um, someone that's infected, the, sorry, that while we are targeting a certain um, type of data, it is limited in capturing the full span of um, uh, COVID in its um, presentation. So one example is that the Department of Precision Medicine at Maastricht University in the Netherlands launched an AI tool for COVID-19 patient triage. It's a personalized medicine platform that enables risk assessment of COVID-19 patients, and it, it, it can integrate various types of available medical data and assess the risk of severe disease needs um, for mechanical ventilation. But such, such assessment tools often go through months of a validation process. And in addition to the biases and blind spots that can shape an AI, AI system, uh, there is the potential for AI systems to introduce, introduce unequal health outcomes during the phases of testing, implementation, and ongoing use. So testing and validating the model's outcomes is a crucial step in ensuring that the AI system is doing what it was designed to do. The original training data may be very different from the data to which a model is being applied. In order to ensure that the model is effectively predicting, there needs to be a period of testing. Uh, so without this testing, there is a concern that it will not um, operate effectively. So for instance, there, um, a model operating on electronic health data that is being used to detect deterioration of patients who develop COVID-19 may have the problem that it was developed before the pandemic and was never thoroughly tested as a deterioration um, predictor of COVID-19 patients continues, or it would appear tested and validated in diverse um, geographic areas. So the model may predict deterioration with some accuracy in these new circumstances, but it's not certain. There needs to be more research and it needs to be better understood what the potential claims of the technology are before it is actually uh, deployed and proven effective. As COVID-19 is a new virus spreading at a rapid pace, lengthy validation of such tools are often being bypassed and they are based on small data sets which are often unrepresentative and biased. So, which requires care and interpretation and use and may be interpreted differently across healthcare providers if guidelines and training are not provided and may only be available to those healthcare providers and clinicians that are wealthier, increasing a potential divide in healthcare access. So, the question becomes how can we better collect this data, evaluate this? and ensure that these technologies are available for all to benefit. So the final one that I want to talk about is social protection, which is probably the one that's been at the heart for many of us. It's been argued um, to be that AI has been needed to manage the pandemic, ease lockdown measures and protect individuals and contain the infection, which these range in evasiveness from thermal imaging um, to scan for potentially infected people by increased temperatures in persons to facial recognition and digital contact tracing apps on mobile devices or wearable technologies. So as I'm sure we're all well aware, several countries, including the UK, explored, has explored and has also enacted digital contract tracing apps and wearable technologies um, as a way for social protection. Such tools can be used as a digital PPE, we could say. It's identifying, it could identify infected frontline key workers before they become symptomatic and limit spread, um, quantitatively demonstrating effectiveness of social distancing and forecast how such implementations may continue um, to reduce spread. But mobile phones and wearable um, apps bring about two issues, the digital divide, and then data protection and mission creep. So as an, as an individual social protection measures, um, those that have a mobile phone or wear mobile phones and wearable technologies are made available 
will only benefit them. But if an AI is set to revolutionize and improve healthcare for all, as the intervention suggests, then it must be available to all. So in the current backdrop, where we know that several countries have enacted this, this has meant that certain groups lose out to the social protection opportunities provided by the AI technology. The other part to this, of course, is the concern around infringing on um, uh, privacy concerns and the opportunity for greater mass surveillance. So the contact tracing applications by design present potential risk to privacy and medical confidentiality. The choices that are made in the design can mitigate these risks and are therefore really vital as part of the design process to, um, to include and to enable um, trust um, and really the effectiveness of the app. So in the UK, the app is, is actually measuring digital exposure and not tracing individual contacts. And this digital proximity um, then provides two interventions. One, it's notifying symptomatic individuals to isolate, and then two, it's tracing contacts of symptomatic cases that which then require the individuals to quarantine. These interventions are aiming to curtail the spread of the virus by encouraging people to self-isolate. And we have seen that the, um, that the app was reportedly, had reportedly prevented thousands of deaths um, and therefore would suggest that it is an effective um, AI intervention. So the one thing to remember is that early in the development of the NHS COVID-19 app, the UK pursued a model which, in which all the data would be stored in a centralized database. The data included to include de-anonymized identifiers of people infected with COVID-19 and the identifiers of all those with whom an infected person had been in contact. This would allow for a network graph or social graph um, to have been uh, developed. But concerns about the centralized model were voiced uh, and following the backlash against this, the government abandoned this and moved to a decentralized approach. The decentralized approach um, was developed by Apple and Google uh, and reduces um, the, or invokes sort of a privacy by design approach. However, this reduces understanding the effectiveness of the app um, in certain populations because we are no longer able to capture some of this data. So we now have that we, we have um, done privacy by design, but potentially um, lost information that could help us to better understand who we need to target. Next. So just in summary, the sources of data um, and the socio-historical patterns of discrimination that are reflected in data are not the only sources of bias in AI, and there are opportunities for um, introducing additional bias at every step of the pipeline. Uh, so the one thing that I would like to raise as part of this is that while AI is um, being considered in these dimensions of both their benefits and their harms is that we should also consider how might it also be used. So let's take, for example, the COVID-19 app, which had a particular purpose in social protection. Um, but what happens now if, or could employers enforce the use of these? The same questions are starting to arise with digital vaccine passports. Is it might be introduced for a certain purpose, but what, how can it, how it might get extended by others? Um, in the vaccine passports, we're looking at its, our movement across borders. And while this would, allow, would enable freedom of movement, it also potentially uh, uh, could infringe on personal data being moved across borders. One other area where I think it's important to recognize is that early on in the pandemic in the US, algorithmic risk assessment tools um, that have documented racial bias 
were being used to decide whether or not inmates would be placed in home confinement. This is further um, racializing the risk of higher COVID-19 infection rates and death rates among incarcerated populations. So this just goes to show that we can have a technology that's been developed for a certain purpose and while it then and then being used in another um, setting. And so the, the, the biases now are trickle down. Next. So as I started off by saying is that my interest is always looking about how we could enable these um, data science and AI opportunities, but how do we balance them out? So we consider the ways in which we could best design, develop, deploy, and govern responsible data flows and AI interventions and drawing out the legal, ethical, technical, and domain principles in a way that also requires stakeholder engagement, multi-sector partnerships, and community engagement. The other um, um, primary um, issue at hand to enable these um, technologies is to unlock data and to unlock them in a way uh, that enables responsible data flows um, whilst preserving privacy. What we've seen through our work is that data access, sharing, availability, and quality standards were imperative in the response to COVID-19. And this spans the whole spectrum of the way that data has been used. Um, and without that, it prevents an, an effective response. Going back to the initial points around bias and inequality, our question becomes how we can better um, understand uh, data and the gaps in it and how we could improve on data, data representativeness and ameliorate against biases and uh, unforeseen consequence, consequences down the line. So to create systems that work well for a diverse range of users, we are grappled with questions such as what populations are included in the training data sets and do they well represent the populations that will interact with the system? Do the historical data sets represent the values we aspire to versus the historical discriminations of gender, race, age? When access to data is limited, as we have seen and uh, in healthcare, these baseline data, data sets may not be representative of the populations of the AI systems we hope to serve and therefore exacerbate inequalities. Next. So just to wrap up to say is that we have seen that AI has the potential to contribute to a set of tools in the fight against COVID-19. However, AI systems in some areas of the pipeline are in greater infancy than others for operational maturity and effectiveness. Data is central to AI effectiveness. And whilst there are rapid number of cases and efforts to gather and share data, this data needs to be um, shared in a way that's responsible and that gives access to everyone in a um, privacy preserving way. Neither COVID-19 nor AI created inequality. And the policy response to the current pandemic uh, is accelerating innovations in AI technologies, and hence the discussions on responsible data and AI and innovation are equally required to lay down appropriate mechanisms to ensure that the benefits of the AI um, to tackle COVID-19 only minimizes the risks and trade-offs. So, uh, I've put here a series of questions um, in which one of my current projects, which is looking at good governance and the rule of law, is aiming to um, address, which is looking at what are the principles, um, legal, human rights, and technical by which data and AI models should be governed, and what are the reforms that may be needed to to data governance, national and international, given the scale of personal data sharing that is required. So I'm gonna flip it on to the next slide here. So I've left us with a question here, which is, are we willing to give up a little freedom and privacy to get a little protection? 
And that's it for me. Great, thank you very much for a really stimulating talk and one that took us through a lot of um, interesting ideas, but helped to kind of encapsulate all of the techniques that have been used for um, the technical mechanisms that have been used to address COVID. I, so does anyone have any questions? So, so I, Angela, I'm going to come and, and just ask you a question. You mentioned mission, uh, sort of, um, sorry, you mentioned creep. And I think, do you, was it mission creep? That actually, yeah. how, how, how will these things actually continue in society? And I was just wondering if you could address that point. Sure. So I think it, it comes about in, in a couple of different ways. And I'm going to make the comparison to um, terrorism uh, for a moment here. So following 9-11 uh, in the US, uh, government um, changed uh, legislation enabling um, you know, searches of, of people, um, collection of personal data um, that was much more widespread um, in response to um, or concerns around security. So, and what we've had here, of course, is that governments also lacked um, relaxed data protection laws in order to address COVID, to tackle COVID-19. So there's a couple of questions. One is whether or not it will return. <laughs> um, do we return back? The other question, of course, is that as we've allowed for new technologies to uh, make use of and collect um, data, is whether or not that will allow or create a um, an, an opportunity to build on other technologies that would infringe in, in or um, in the same way, which is why I sort of go back to you know my my last question of what are we willing to give up for something, whether that's protection, whether or not that's something faster, shinier. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think that's what we're seeing. The other form of this is the example that I gave around, um, you know, a tool such as uh, risk assessment tools. This is for probation that um, we know have some uh, bias in it. And they were then being used in another context of should we release um, people earlier in COVID-19, which was just exacerbating the issue we have right now with um, our um, our apps, including the, the potential of um, digital vaccine passports, of how they might get used and in what settings, what right, what you know, what's the right do we have as an employee versus what right does an employer have to to mandate such tools? Um, see, so question from him. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm sorry if I don't put on my camera. I've just got like a swollen eye today. It's pretty unsightly, so. <laughs> I'm sorry uh, but, to hear that. But thank you very much, Anjali, for this really, really interesting presentation. And, um, you know, I, I work as well with uh, some issues in AI and a lot of our work is also very much focused on the human rights aspects that uh, you have highlighted. Um, maybe not so much directly related uh, to the COVID examples that have been given, but um, more about AI generally in healthcare. Um, so I work at um, Brunel Law School and also I'm a researcher at the Center for AI and we're currently in the process of building this AI in healthcare ecosystem together with stakeholders like uh, you know, uh, scientists, clinicians, uh, doctors, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that came up, especially with the development of AI technological tools that could be used in healthcare is the idea, or rather the concept of ethics and about trustworthy and responsible innovation, especially where there's uh, data-driven technologies that are concerned, right? I'm just wondering about your view about how you 
you think the role of ethics may fit in, in the, let's say early stage development of AI technologies in healthcare. I mean, um, I, I'm not an expert in this field at all, but I've read some stuff about you know, ethics washing and some voices saying that um, ethics itself in AI has been co-opted by um, very powerful industry actors, for instance. And I'm just wondering if you may have a view on this and how you think that this may actually impact on the human rights components uh, that we're all trying to make sure are in place. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your question. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to start off by saying I probably start off with the law and, you know, human rights principles, which I feel are um, established, something that you can, you can actually pinpoint, whereas um, the ethics starts to bring us into a broader range and depending, you know, ethics, um, some people will say that it includes the, the, the legal realm as well, um, which uh, I'd rather not argue <laughs> here. But I think for me, again, it's starting off with some of the human rights and, and the, the legal areas of data protection than what we need to be focused on. I think where ethics starts to come in um, maybe uh, more pragmatically is thinking about what are the consequences of combining certain data sources. Um, and, you know, what if, um, from that perspective, the other part of it is going back to the values and community engagement on this. And so what what is it that we value as a community or the community that's most at risk from these interventions? Does that sort of... Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Anjali. I just was curious about uh, your view as well, because um, I mean, obviously, uh, as I'm a lawyer also, so I always start with law and human rights, uh, but it's just uh, lately because of the uh, interdisciplinary nature of the research that I've undertaken, it's uh, it's sort of forced me to sit back and consider these other perspectives and how they work in as well, you know, to our notion of law, legal pos positivity, and all that. Thanks so much. I mean, what I will add is that with some of the projects where we're actually we're looking at developing the data science and AI methods, I do my team will often include not just the data science people, but a law and an ethics mm -hmm. person. And in engaging with the community, it's been an anthropologist. Um, so it, it is very much bringing a multidisciplinary team. And often in cases, it's bringing a law and an ethics person. And um, I, I often see where they overlap more than anything, but there might be considerations. So for example, in areas of online harms, we look at um, the consequences, not just the ethical considerations or human rights considerations in terms of the data and the development of the tool, but actually the potential um, concerns of the researcher um, that in, who's yeah, going through yeah. the material that might yes. um, have some unforeseen harm on them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to go to the chat. Um, David, do you still want to ask a question? Uh, hello, my apologies, I'm in the noisy area, that's why I wrote it down, so I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on uh, some of the early insights, preliminary insights from your research, you mentioned that this is the topic of your uh, current research. Okay, I, th I think... <laughs> I think the technology. Yeah. Um, do you, I think what you have identified as early insights so far? Did you I, get that question? I didn't quite catch David. He went a little robotic. I think at least at my end. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody else caught him more clearly. So his question from the chat, which I think he's probably expanded a little bit, was. Um, could you tell um, us a little bit more about preliminary insights from your project, i.e. what are some of the most relevant principles approaches to guide policy decisions? Did you want to say more on that? 
Um, so we are very much in the early days of our, our work. Um, we are looking at a few case studies. Um, uh, I, so I'm assuming David is speaking about the um, good governance and public trust in um, data-driven technologies project. Uh, Let's assume so. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so while that's early days, we have been looking at what the landscape is um, across certain technologies that have been um, developed uh, globally and what has been the, the legal measures um, that are enabling or creating potential barriers in that. So um, I probably don't have that much more to add at the moment. Um, what I'm particularly interested in and, and looking at too is um, the issue that I raised uh, with some of these potential digital apps, whether we're talking about vaccine passports or, or COVID, um, the digital contact tracing or proximity apps, which is who else might make use of it um, in the context of employers or um, hospitality and what are the potential um, uh, where, where does the law help the law and the technical areas help to um, both uh, potentially actualize the AI benefits but also mediate against some of the risks and harms great thank you um, so we have someone else with their hand up. Is that um, P. Who? Apologies. Uh, yes. Hi. Good evening. I'm asking your name wrongly. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, you are. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anjali, for the great lecture. So I just kind of have a comment and a rhetorical question, maybe. So I understand uh, that it's very exciting uh, to work with artificial intelligence, and I'm also still trying to get. Uh, the hang of it and trying to understand how it can be applied but I also feel that uh, you know it, it cannot be a replacement so artificial intelligence cannot be a replacement for the natural conscience or you know the social protection measures that should exist anyway I mean it's the technology is not going to uh, push us into giving that social protection measures unless the governments or the policymakers want it. So that's that has been the whole scenario. I mean, eventually the unit of your data is finally, uh, the source of that data is an individual or a household or a family, or so eventually you are going down to that uh, data set, which is maybe a census data or some kind of a survey or some kind of a mostly a survey basically so as long as it's a mobile phone survey or you know your bill being generated it's okay but when you get into the task of asking about uh, social categories gender and personal details uh, I, I i believe that if the underrepresented uh, categories underrepresented people are uh, being represented enough then the problem and we want we we want an affirmative action we want some kind of positive action to take place in terms of healthcare or any kind it will automatically happen uh, through the public good services public services irrespective of the technology existing there and because it is not happening is because people are underrepresented and in any sector I mean, and for any technology that will hold true okay so so the question is just because the technology occurs or exists doesn't mean that we have to use it and can we have laws against the use of it because just like for human cloning we, people realize that as long as it is in the lab, it's good. You can keep on researching it, but we don't want it in our lives. So uh, we have the uh, the the law for we have the technology for determining the gender of the fetus, but in India it is banned, right? So we have the technology, but for the social reasons, we know 
why it is being misused and it will be misused more than being used for a good purpose so can we have laws because it's it's being pushed down our throat we didn't demand it and and the other point is who owns the data finally even if you unlock the data even if it flows and is inclusive who is the owner of that data and uh, have people it, it may be decentralized the collection may be decentralized but the ownership is still in a few hands so does the community own the data do do they demand that kind of technology or do they even understand what it means so when when we talk about informed consent if just signing the paper doesn't mean informed consent do are they even empowered to understand what their rights and laws are are they even Uh, free enough to demand that kind of a justice from the legal system or the social protection system so that's that's my uh, worry in the larger framework thank you thank you pihu um i might try to address some of the issues that you raised in in backwards order and then please them um, you know jump in if i've i've missed something so I'll start off with I think um data and consent and and people's awareness. So I think this has been a big issue um about um people being aware of how their data is being used and what are the mechanisms in which they can also opt in or opt out. It's a case maybe and we've seen that recently um with the announcement of um uh personal healthcare data potentially being shared. um and it also being potentially vague as to who these third parties might be so while there are the benefits for um sharing the data i think there's a question about um uh things being as transparent as possible and mechanisms for um uh removing well if we didn't even consent but it was just automated then um how we might opt out of out of these spaces and and that invokes i think a couple of other things one is that the since the ai is reliant on it um these are often public private partnerships or or some um uh joint area in terms of a, a private company may have actually developed the tool but it's based on um sort of the public sector own data but going back to your question of who owns the data i think is is has been an ongoing question um and and with the just going back to awareness is that um some of my work has also looked at um genetic data and you know the the opportunity where people can now swab their mouths and and send off their dna to learn yeah. that they're you know 7% finnish or something we've just made that up but anyhow however <laughs> um whatever you learn about your ethnicity or about even um um you know preponderance for a certain disease outcome is that uh in the US what's happened is that um uh, law enforcement has also been able to use some of this um ancestry data and they were able to identify um a, a prolific sort of golden state what's known as California golden state killer and in that regard it was you know you are not just giving away your own data but actually your family's data it is a it it is much more um it's not only more personal i think but it's also giving away um the network of your of your family so yeah. these are consequences that i think people need to better understand um in that regard i think uh whether or not we need to actually implement some of these technologies that are being developed is obviously a question that um it's constantly being at the forefront these questions we've seen how facial recognition technology has been developed it's tried to be it's been implemented in some instances it's also been pulled back and yeah. and so i i i think with the ones in terms of social protection what we're also seeing is that i mean in the uk the covid-19 um nhs covid-19 app did not um take away from the manual contact tracing it was used in addition to support right mm -hmm. 
So some of these are probably working alongside, um, but there's still questions, of course, about whether or not some of these technologies should be used, regardless of whether or not you have data representativeness. I mean, I mean, I appreciate the its existence and use in uh, management fields. Like uh, when you when you talk about say supply chain management of vaccines, and if you are monitoring temperature of all the warehouses across the country, and you you know there is an alarm system and everything, you will the the your AI system tells you that okay the supply is getting over, and if that if that part of the supply chain management which has to be centrally controlled you know where the government needs to intervene if that part is you know made more efficient through ai i understand it but where it interacts with human beings directly and asks for their personal data and as you rightly said the the ancestry itself that is a little i mean it's not little in fact that's the biggest problem i i see so can we like kind of restrict its usage maybe that you know, only in places where the goods are being moved, it should be used, but not in right the direct connection with human beings. Something of that sort can be discussed. I think that's a great debate. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thanks. Do we have any more questions? So um, I'm I'm just wondering um, you you you've covered a lot um, and I think maybe if there's no more questions I know it's certainly quite hot here <laughs> I think that um, it's hot for England I might say for all of those people who are from other countries which are a lot hotter than England um, it is hot for England at the moment so. If there's no more questions, I think we might draw the seminar to a close. Um, <laughs> someone's saying it's boiling. Yes. Um, so, um, and, and to thank you very much for um, a fantastic seminar. It's, I've taken pages and pages of notes and I'm sure everyone else has. And you've certainly um, really kind of stimulated my brain to start asking more questions. So thank you very, very much. I'll give you a clap. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to meeting you in person. <laughs> that would be fantastic. <laughs> Lots of claps coming up. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll bring the session to a close. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Anjali. That was a thank lovely you. talk. Yeah, thank thanks you a so lot. Much, yeah, yeah. It's and really I look forward to meeting you in person too. Yeah, yes. yeah. Be great. I, I See you be, later. I've got to. I've got to rush now, but um, I'd love to talk to you a bit more about your work and what you're doing. It sounds amazing. That would be great. I look forward to that. And thank you again for rescheduling and and uh, making this happen. Oh, the least we can do. And um, yeah, just wishing you all the best. Thank you, you too. Look forward to catching. All we, right. should, we should be able to um, have your podcast ready in a couple of weeks uh, up on our website. I'll let you know. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Steve. Bye.